Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon. This week we are going to talk about a new text, a novel entitled A Motor Car Divorce. And on Thursday I will continue with the group activity on the project. I will talk more about the template for the cataloging of the short stories for the project looking with you at actual examples on thursday we will also uh, watch scenes from a new film it's a silent film actually a hybrid film because there are a few noises and at least one word um, because it was produced right around the time 1927 when uh, american theaters were not ready everywhere to switch to films with sound. So even though the technology was there, uh, there were just some experiments at first. They were afraid they might limit the market for the film otherwise. So I use the board to illustrate some of the uh, themes and the narrative patterns in this novel. So the title of the novel, as I said, is The Motor Car Divorce. It was published in 1906. As usual, it appeared in installments on magazines and then was published as a book. The author is an actress called Louise Closser Hale, and I'll talk about her and her biography. She was born in Chicago, but she spent quite a few years in New York City when she was not touring through the United States or Europe. And later on, she moved to California exactly to be in the films. She acted in about 30 films and before she died in 1933, she had been born in 1872. By the time she published this novel, she was already uh, famous in her profession, not as the female lead of theatrical performances, but rather as a character actress. That is to say, an actress that appeared in um, uh, supporting roles. Can we put away the phones? And, and of course, hopefully there are no ear earbuds, uh, etc. But thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes. Now we, we get to the point. Body search for for earbuds. Okay. So, uh, and I'll, I'll show you. I'll, I'll show a scene also where she appears that you can find in YouTube. But let's talk about the novel. First of all, 1906. We're getting closer to the time when automobiles would be mass produced. 1908 is when the Ford Model T comes out, the first car to be produced in the world in the millions during the next 20, 25 years. And production numbers are going up very rapidly. In the United States, we've gone at this point from numbers that are in the thousands to numbers that are in the tens of thousands of cars produced and sold per year. And soon enough, it'll move to hundreds of thousands. Therefore, the automobile is a trendy product that looks appealing not just to the wealthiest, in society to the one percenters, but something that even the upper middle classes, the members of the upper middle class, can aspire to. The story is very simple. We have a young couple, John and Margaret, but she's always referred to as Peggy throughout the novel, and Margaret only in a few passages. They decide to go on a trip to Europe before 
they get the titular divorce, the divorce from the title. Of course, there are twists. Yes, Madison. So they decide to take a divorce before they went to Europe? It was like the last hurrah for their relationship? They, they first decide to get an automobile together with their divorce. And in fact, the automobile will be the instrument of their divorce. I see. They think that while they're traveling through Europe together for one last trip, Peggy will annotate on her diary, a diary she explicitly purchased for this purpose in mind, with this purpose in mind. Peggy is supposed to annotate all the various ways in which John will be mistreating her uh, under the tension of the trip, because once they come back to the United States, they're planning to file for divorce, appear in front of a judge, and during this period, you need a motivation. You need to justify in front of the judge uh, the reasons you need to present, reasons that are strong enough. Otherwise, your divorce, your request for divorce, your petition for a divorce can be actually rejected by the judge. So the agreement between them is that Peggy will annotate all the instances of bad behavior, bad marital behavior uh, displayed by John during the trip. And once they appear in front of a judge, John agrees that he will not deny, he will not uh, make it an issue, right? That it will just admit to his wrongdoings so that they can proceed with the divorce. So what are the twists in this apparently linear plot? One of them you've already uh, heard from my response to Madison, that is to say the fact that the divorce doesn't come or is not supposed to come at the conclusion of the novel as a result of events that happen through the novel. It is in fact something that is part of their plan. From the very beginning, however, keep in mind that this is twist number one, that there is no real crisis in this couple that would justify their plans for divorce. The way this comes up is simply that Peggy, let me uh, give you a short profile of the characters. John works in advertising in the city, in New York City. They both live in Morristown, New Jersey, about 30 miles from Manhattan. They're a couple, a wealthy couple uh, from the upper classes or upper middle class. They have staff in the house, for example, and they can afford to purchase an automobile. They can also afford to go on a long trip to Europe that will last several weeks, right? Even though you notice when you read that while traveling through Europe, of course, they uh, stop at various small hotels in Italy. And usually, whenever the name of the hotel is mentioned, I've worked on this novel and I checked, the hotel is real. So this is also the result possibly of a trip the writer Louise and her husband Walter Hale did together while she was performing on and off on stage in London. Uh, when they stop at hotels, for the most part, those are small places and they eat a lot of eggs to save money, right? You, you find a lot of references to uova al tegamino, which in Italy would be fried eggs made in a small pan, which is one of the cheapest dishes you can no crisis. As I said, John works in advertisement and is successful enough. Um, also, the stereotypical 
uh, may lead in a romance uh, novel. Uh, handsome, tall man, elegant, confident, displaying leadership, always in control, uh, not easy to, to scare. And they're a relatively young couple, John in his, in his late 20s, uh, sorry, John is in his late 30s, and Peggy in her late 20s, she's about 27. We learn at the beginning of the novel, and that is one of the excerpts that I have included, how they got together. Uh, Peggy went to visit a relative, stayed there a while, and in that place, she uh, uh, met John. Uh, Peggy at that point was 17 and he was about 10 years older. They got married. Oh my God. Um, uh, and uh, later on, 10 years later, at the beginning of the story in the novel, we find that Peggy is not working, staying at home, going out for shopping, but also going out to attend the meetings of this female club in New York called the Minerva Club, um, which is one of several real clubs that existed in the city at that time, where women discussed issues that in some ways established the beginning of feminism. During one of those meetings, they talk about an idea that had appeared in real life in an article by British novelist George Meredith, the so-called 10-year clause. The idea by Meredith was that marriage was obsolete as a long-term relationship and that the marriage contract had to include a 10-year clause by virtue of which the couple after 10 years could re-examine the reasons why they were together and decide to go their separate ways if they found that there wasn't a strong connection anymore. Okay? Kind of an easy way out. Of course, a lot of women during this meeting talk in favor of this idea, and especially Peggy, um, because she wants to be appreciated by others. She wants to be admired. We'll talk about the representation of Peggy by Louise, who by the time the novel was published was already 34, so older than the character the character is not Louise. The writer Louise is directing irony at Peggy as a young woman who's trying desperately to be successful socially and to be fashionable, to say everything that is fashionable at that time, to wear anything that is fashionable, to purchase fashionable things such as the automobile. So at the end of a meeting where Peggy has been celebrated as a big supporter of this novel idea of the 10-year close, someone says, why don't you demonstrate? And she says, of course, I'm going to talk to my husband about this. I'm going to divorce to uh, uh, make this 10-year close a reality she's in fact at that point in the story, being married only for 10 years. So she comes home, she <laughs> talks to John, and John says, okay, if you want a divorce, I'll grant you a divorce, but how will we go about that? John says, I don't want this to be uh, ruining our reputation, so we have to think about this, and then there are the legality. And so they come up with this plan, that the trip to Europe will be different, and that's the other twist. Because the trip will be done not as most people would have done it at that time, using a ship to get to Europe and then trains 
or carriages to move from place to place, they will purchase an auto, an automobile, they'll be their first automobile, they will take it with them on the ship to Naples, and from there they will drive through central and northern Italy, then cross the border into southern France, see southern France, which was already a famous locale for tourism during that period, and then drive north to Paris. Paris is the final destination of their trip. After Paris, they would drive to some place on the Atlantic, like Le Havre to Cherbourg, and from there take a ship back to the United States to proceed with their divorce and with their divorce plans. So, as I said, a couple going to Europe to finally come back and get divorced. However, first twist, there is no real crisis between them and the auto will play, the automobile will play a part, will make their trip unique and in some ways will make their life different, right? This is very much a novel about consumerism. So the entire foundation of the novel is that whatever you purchase, whether it be a product like the automobile or a trip, like a trip to Europe, will make your life different, right? So this idea, the, the general idea of the culture of consumerism is that change comes from the outside, from the products you buy, from the things you wear, the accessory you display in public, or big ticket items such as an automobile. What are the other twists? Because of course you don't expect everything to go as planned during this trip. The first thing is that Peggy will soon find out that there is going to be a crisis. Because during this trip on the ship, and then at several points through their trip through Italy and France, they will meet three other characters. A widow, a woman by the name of Mrs. Baring, who <coughs> is herself a cart nut. Someone who drives an automobile, knows how to work on an automobile, and therefore an independent woman, not subjected to the authority of the husband, and one that is on the cutting edge of this new technological society where women can interact successfully with uh, technologies such as the automobile. Obviously, because of their common shared interest, John, who's already become a cardinal by the time they get to uh, the, sh the they, they start traveling on the ship, John and Mrs. Berry spend a lot of time talking about their cars, talking about cars in general, experiences, and of course, issues they face during their automobile trip through Italy. Think of a country such as Italy not equipped at all, even though there were enough autom automobiles in Italy, they were mostly confined to the large urban areas. If you traveled uh, through the rural areas of Italy, you would have found almost no support system in terms of shops, difficult to find ben gasoline, gas, etc. So they spend a lot of time and Peggy realizes that she's not completely happy. Yes, of course, they're supposed to divorce. So in a way, she's happy that John can find someone that after they separate, maybe uh, he can marry uh, Mrs. Baring. At the same time, she starts to get jealous, as you can imagine. So the second twist is that instead of getting separated, even though the process has started that psychologically uh, Peggy is trying to detach herself, to distance herself from her husband, even though their uh, relationship, their uh, contacts are perfectly cordial, uh, 
and even affectionate, she finds that she's falling back in love with her husband, that at some point she wants to take him from this widow, Mrs. Berry, when she's convinced that these two really are developing feelings for one another. And so instead of getting a divorce, she will get back with John. But also the automobile will become a part of their life because she learns indirectly how to drive. She doesn't really drive by herself until, until the very end of the novel. The very end of the novel is when you have two twists. First is whether or not John will want to go back to her now that he's discovered someone like Mrs. Baring who's a better fit for him because of the shared passion for the automobile, because they are both competent in that field, because she understands a lot about the mechanics of the automobile, whereas Peggy is not. She even tries to study a guide, a manual, to learn more about the engine and how to operate the automobile, but really to no avail. <laughs> so at the end, we discover that in fact, John was never in love with this woman. They just had this interest in common, but this woman is about to get married with another character. They found during the trip an artist by the name of Douglas Warwick. And the other moment of narrative tension is whether in fact when she knows that John is not lost emotionally to her, that John still has feelings for her, the other dilemma at the very end of the novel is whether John will survive an accident because during one last argument in France, John falls down there in the countryside of France, miles away from any village. He falls down, hits his head on a rock, of course, loses consciousness, seems to be in serious condition. And this is when, for the first time, Peggy, who's being there by John while John was driving and therefore observing everything John was doing, Peggy takes the automobile to go and find a doctor to rescue and save John. She leaves John where he is because she has learned that in such a, in a situation, it's not good to move uh, someone who has suffered a head trauma she takes the automobile, she drives very quickly and finds a hospital and a doctor. She even escapes the French police and eventually uh, the doctor will go and retrieve John. John will be uh, cured in the hospital and they'll go back as a couple. But look at what has happened. You know about the particulars of their marriage, which was not based on a really mature decision, right? They frequented each other briefly. She was very young. And now, through the twists and turns of the story, Peggy, who intended to divorce, has the opportunity to choose her husband back. So, of course, her decision is not the most radical, the most revolutionary, to live by herself and to separate from her husband. However, by the end of the novel, she has chosen to stay married. And this is part of her process of empowerment. And the automobile has a lot to do with this very process, right? Because it is 
through the time spent driving on the automobile. It is through the occasions, the situations when they both have issues they have together to face mechanical issues and other and have other other uh, adventures that Peggy really comes to realize the nature of her attachment to John. Of course, the car is also instrumental in the new marriage, in the new married time of this couple, because the automobile will allow her to save John. But something else, the conclusion is really uh, funny and unique, something else that happens at the very end is that during this dramatic moment when Peggy has to remember how one operates a car, keep in mind we are talking about a car from 1906 and it's a real car that you find in the novel uh, by a brand called Northern as well as it is real, the car, uh, the, the car driven by Mrs. Bering is real. It's a Swiss car, uh, um, a brand, a company called Martini. Both of those companies, of course, later disappeared. It is during this dramatic moment when Peggy is trying to remember how to operate the car. And she's very well aware that she could be losing her husband, that her husband might die regardless of her efforts, that she discovers how exhilarating, how thrilling the experience of driving a car at fast speed. She's trying to go as fast as possible to save her husband. And the mark of her newfound independence is the fact that she feels bound to feel bad for her husband. Right? And she knows that her moral obligation to her husband would be to feel sad at that time, yet she cannot deny that this experience, this high-speed ride, is very exciting and something that overpowers even her feelings or her moral obligations towards her husband. So, in a way, they get back together, but the hierarchy uh, between husband and wife has changed. For once, because Peggy has gone through, uh, has found the courage to say, I want a divorce. I, I want us to go through this, right? It's her decision. And also, because by the end of the novel, the automobile is as important as the husband, or more important than the husband, which is also typical of the culture of consumerism, because the culture of consumerism finds early on that the family itself is an obstacle to marketing plans. You don't want to sell a product to the family. You want to break down the sell that is the social element, the social uh, group that the family is, to make every member of the family a separate consumer. Someone empowered with the desires and the rights to purchase something, okay? So the, the fact that the product itself becomes like a wedge between this couple, that she feels her own relationship with the automobile, which is, she comes to realize, as important as the relationship with the husband, is typical of a new profile, a new social profile, where even uh, the, the family, the marriage, the couple, is not as strong as the connection you may feel with a product that helps you build your identity and your social persona. And throughout the trip, especially in Italy, especially in the countryside of Italy, imagine a wealthy American couple coming with an automobile, dressed elegantly, wear clothes she, they both, have purchased in New York City. Imagine the admiration that is directed at them. And there are specific scenes where you find that. 
as well as you find a full chapter devoted to the purchase of the automobile, how they come to pick their automobile and what you have to go through in order to get an automobile. So consumption becomes a big theme in the novel because the characters, especially Peggy, are being seen based on what they uh, show in public. And therefore, the clothes they wear, the fact that they drive with an automobile, etc. Okay, it's not enough that I brought my notes because without my reading glasses, I feel that I'm like, yeah, what is it? Sounds like scenes from Curb Your Enthusiasm or a film with Steve Martin. Okay, so that's fine. I think that's more than fine. Let me just add that the style of the novel is not dramatic. There is some pseudo drama, but it's never a real drama. It's more like a comedy. There is plenty of irony. In fact, make sure when you read the excerpts that you try to recognize the irony in the representation of their characters and their uh, situation. In some ways, what Louise did was to build a narrative that is a satire of young couples from 1907, of young American couples who are trying desperately, in this case especially Peggy, to be fashionable or to appear cool with the help also of products they buy. Because even though Peggy comes home and says, I want a divorce, you need to help me, I want a divorce, which is kind of paradoxical, right? She's not breaking this up to, uh, to, to her husband in a forceful way. She's still falling back on the roles of the traditional couples, right? Where the wife is being supported by the husband. So if Peggy asks for a divorce and gets her husband's agreement to go through the process of this trip and eventually come back and have a divorce, all of this does not really make her a feminist, simply because she has read about the tenure clause and she wants to be seen as a pioneer by the other women of the Minerva Club. There is constant irony directed by the narrator, by Louise, against Peggy, because Peggy doesn't have any strong convictions other than, I want to do whatever is trendy. I want to do everything in my power to be seen as fashionable and be fashionable is the real measure, measure of her success. So keep this in mind. And now I'll go through some of the notes in the page and read together with you some of the passages found at the beginning of the novel. Okay. But I hope the presentation was, the summary was clear enough to give you a sense of the novel before you read the various excerpts. As I said before, uh, Louise from, was from Chicago. She uh, studied acting in drama schools in uh, both New York and Boston, started acting as a supporting actress in theaters in New York City. She became very famous in 1906 with a play by George Bernard Shaw, a British playwright that was very popular at that time. The title of the play was Candida. And the play was so popular that the newspapers in New York created the definition of Candida mania because it appeared as if the entire city was talking about this play and everyone had seen the play at least once and the others wanted to see it and then they went on tour uh, and she did also other plays in the United States and in London and most probably while she was in Europe she went to visit Italy. We don't know for sure 
if she was in every single place described in the book. The book is also a travelogue. It is the report of an actual tra journey through Italy and southern France. Um, but for some of those places, she might have used the guides that existed at that time, like the Bedecker, the Murray, both were very detailed guides that showed you not only what you needed to see or the general uh, impression uh, of a town or a village, but also places where you could stay, places where you could eat, and therefore some of the specific places, the hotels that I found existed in real life, she might have visited them with her husband or she might have gotten their names from the guide trying to then imagine what the fictional couple in the book would have found and could have done there. You see from this image itself the kind of attitude she uh, directs towards the character. You see from, from her face the place of wisdom of this ironic, uh, good-tempered kind of uh, irony that uh, she uh, uses in the novel. Again, during a time where people were changing, going through a social change and um, being a qualified consumer, being able to define yourself through whatever you purchase became particularly important. While she was in New York City, she, uh, like other artists, left her signature that you find in here on a door in the back of a bookshop in the Greenwich Village. You can see the door in here. This door is full of signatures and short phrases by artists and writers that were in New York City during that time. Not only, but she also uh, went, of course, to the Hamptons to visit friends there, right? So she was both in New York and Long Island. You can find a brief bio in uh, Wikipedia and a better one inside the Encyclopedia Britannica, just to give you a sense I included a few links if you're curious. As I said, she was married with Walter Hale, who was also acting, but not full time. He was an illustrator. And in fact, the illustrations in the book that I have, some of which I've included in the excerpt, were done by Walter. And they traveled together extensively. And she wrote other books that were purely travelogues purely chronicles of their travels through different areas of Europe and the United States. But she died during World War I and she became a widow. When he died, I think he died in 1917, uh, not 1915, sorry, there it is. That's where the obituary was published in the book, man. He was defined there as an authority on modern in Europe among Americans that no one else in the US knew as much about traveling through Europe with an automobile than Walter. So even though she wrote the book and, and she was the only one writing the book, but she put in the book some of the experiences she did for sure with her husband. As I said earlier, in 1929, she moved to California, where she died and appeared in approximately 30 films. You can find all the films she was in, first silent films, then um, pretty soon uh, sound, films with sound in uh, the Into the Movie database. And you can find her here. This is one of her last movies, Dinner at Eight.
no matter the, the audio, we can adjust it, but of course, so she's this old woman in the back, old rich woman, rich old woman. And you can see how someone who <coughs> was a professional in theaters could move to films because these films are very theatrical. Notice, for example, how long she kept her position before moving, right? She came to the desk in the kitchen and she remained perfectly still while the younger woman was pronouncing her lines. And the same is true of the staff in the kitchen who doesn't move until she has to react to others, something that was very true, typical of the style of films from the 1920s, 30s, and 40s especially, but uh, even, even later, sometimes you, you do find this is true even on of, of modern films. So you can watch more of her to get a sense of her voice, her attitude, which I think is important to keep in mind when you read the novel. The novel is being narrated by this woman with this kind of experience, with this kind of view of life. So I called it a light romantic comedy, right? It is a motor romance. The automobile helps this couple fall back in love, right? And it's light because there is never real drama. Even when Peg is desperate and she thinks she's about to lose her husband, we as readers and the narrator, we both know on both sides of the page that the character is delusional, that the character has misunderstood everything, that her idea that John is falling in love with Mrs. Baring is based on her inability to read others in a social context simply because Peg is a narcissist. Peg wants to be at the center of every social situation and that makes her less able to understand the other's positions, the positions of the other people in the same context. And since everything is about herself at some point, based on small clues, or even the fact that her husband is spending a little bit of time talking about automobiles with this widow, she, she believes, oh, he's neglecting me, it's a done deal, he's gone the other side, he's falling in love for this woman. So, it's a martial romance of sorts, simply because the typical, traditional martial romance is in a narrative where the characters fall in love the first time thanks to the automobile, not the second time, as it is the case for this couple. And I'm not going, of course, to go through all the notes. You can review these notes um, yourself. But just look at this passage highlighted in pink that you find almost midway through the novel, the novel is a little more than 300 pages, about the changed hierarchy within her marriage. She says, strange my course of reasoning, once the motor car would not have figured in it, meaning I would never imagine that the automobile would be counted as one of the elements in my married life. Later, it was John and the motor car. So John first, the automobile second. Now it appears to be motor car and John. And as I said, by the end, the conspicuous manifestation of her empowerment is that even though she's supposed to be crying about her dying husband while she's, or, or feeling sad about him while she's driving the car at high speed, she finds this really thrilling, right? So she feels free to feel what she's feeling, right? She doesn't have the self-censorship exercised by society in regards to feeling what she's feeling during this car ride. And the car ride is beautiful. That, that's the idea, and, and, and she admits to it, okay? And in some ways, this is also about falling in love with a product 
out and in love because at the beginning Peggy doesn't want the automobile and it is clear from at least one reference that she would not have allowed her husband to purchase one but after they purchase the automobile and they go through this adventure she becomes more and more connected to the automobile in spite of the fact that there is some jealousy because the other woman is an automobile nut. Very much a consumerist novel because as I said the, I, the public persona of the characters is often being defined by what they're able to purchase, which is not just clothes, accessories, the automobile, but also the trip, the stay in hotels in nice Italian places, right? The outside part of their experience defines who they are. And there is nothing more than that. They're, they're shallow, they're both shallow people, essentially, right? If you're defined by your role as a consumerist, then by definition you're kind of shallow. And, okay, I need to, just, just to emphasize that every aspect of that story that seems to be critical is in fact not. It's a comedy, it's full of irony, the social dilemmas you find there are not really that dramatic or critical for the characters. And as I said before, keep in mind that you have two distinct voices. The narrator's voice is different from the character. Okay? That is to say, Louise does not identify with Peggy. Louise is a different kind of woman who's making fun of women, American women such as Peggy, who go through life driven by their desire to be popular socially, okay? The literature of this period is defined as Edwardian from King Edward, who was King of England during this period, the early 1900s, and before, right before World War I, or Atlantic literature, meaning that even people who wrote in the U.S., especially in the American Northeast, did so with a style that imitated British language and British literature. So the end result is something that is in between, and that's why it is defined as Atlantic literature. It's not purely American, it's not purely British. And the same is true of films. And would remain true of films and plays produced until the 1940s. For example, even the language that you find in the talk is from the 1930s, the accent, the cadence, the style, is kind of British. Because British defines elegant in the upper classes in American society during that period, and the media, including cinema and theater, reflect that, okay? So, again, if you pay attention to films from the 1930s, but sometimes even later, you will find that the accent is not the American accent spoken even by the middle classes during that time. But it's a, an elegant American trying to pass as someone who could be acknowledged as elegant and upper class globally, even outside of the United States, okay? And of course, social mobility is a theme here, right? You have two characters, like in many American films of later years, who are moving up in society, right? Their crises are just the middle ground between them and the next success, right? There is no real crisis. They don't have much at stake to lose. And part of their British-like behavior is this emphasis on self-control, right? These two characters, John especially, but even Peggy, who's supposed to be more passionate, more volatile, they're both very controlled emotionally. They're never really 
revealing what they feel to the other, especially their spouse. Okay? And uh, their dialogue is often a form of banter, but it's a very upper class kind of banter or theatrical banter. It's not like a couple arguing. It's like a couple on stage that is arguing. And keep in mind that they are so bourgeois that when they go to hotels in Italy, they usually sleep in separate bedrooms. And there are plenty of references to this. Right? This is su to, supposed to be the way of life of the upper class. I don't know if you've ever visited the mansions in Newport, Rhode Island. For example, the Vanderbilt Mansion. And you find there that Mr. and Mrs. Vanderbilt had bedrooms in different places inside this big palace. Okay? I think they shared the bathroom, this, this very big bathroom, as big as this classroom, but they had separate bedrooms. The full novel is full of humor, of light humor, so don't take any, everything seriously when you read about this. And in terms of other strategies that indirectly confirm the self-control as the leitmotif of the novel is the fact that they are really detached emotionally. They're never fully taken by their emotion, or if they're about to be taken by their emotions in any kind of situation, they withdraw. And, and therefore, there is no real drama, nor, uh, no big confrontation until the very end, but even at the end, you know that it's pretend kind of argument because you know that John never intended to really leave Peggy and get married to another woman. And I called it emotional math because it's all about, am I happy? Am I more happy, less happy than I was yesterday? That's the trajectory of the characters, not, oh my God, there is this tragedy. How will I get out? of that intact, right, as a person. How will I survive and go on with, with my life? <clears throat> and it's a very controlled kind of environment that is described in the narrative where the elements of reality, the elements of the reality in which the two characters exist are reduced to the bare minimum. They don't really have all the issues, psychological or physical, that real people are, right? They're characters in a comedy. Keep that in mind. The places that you find in here, the Women's Club, the Minerva Club, which is fictional, but a model of proto-feminist clubs that exist in the city, the couple's home that you find in the initial chapters in New Jersey, it's a rich couple's house, then they go on a ship, a steamship of course, they have first class ticket and they mix only with first class people including the characters they will uh, encounter repeatedly during their trip one of the places, of course, they spend a lot of time in is the car itself, right? They spend a lot of time driving, interacting with the landscape and the people of Italy from the car and talking to each other on the car. And the car has a name, the nickname found by Peggy and agreed upon by both for the car is the means, meaning that the car is the means to their divorce, right? The, the, Thanks to the car, they'll be able to get the divorce she wants, and that he wants to, wants to have as well, to, just to please her. And then, of course, mostly you have Italy, a little bit of France, but mostly for the trip, it's a description of Italian places, and it's an exotic representation of Italy, right? A place for tourists, or even when they encounter real Italians, they're all picturesque Italians. Right? There is no real-life Italian. They're all memorable, stereotypical characters they meet in Italy. And it's easy to understand that it's a place where they don't have to abide by local rules during their trip. They're 
rich Americans going through Italy, moving from place to place. They don't have to really respect social rules. And they don't have really to observe rules that exist in America because they're in Italy. So the exotic nature of Italy is also that it is a place where during the trip they can recreate themselves. They can rebuild themselves as new people with new identities. And they do this to a degree, right? They still remind, remain upper class people, right? Italy therefore becomes a place for anarchy because there are no social rules being enforced and extreme freedom. You can pretend to be whoever you want. At some point, in fact, they'll be mistaken for a couple that is eloped and that is being pursued by the police. And they'll leave the experience of that couple. And of course, chaos in every story written in Great Britain. Uh, think about... Uh, um, a Room with a Window by Furster, or this one in every story written in Great Britain or the US about Italy. Italy is the place where you find social chaos, right? Not a strong organization, not a strong, strongly organized country. But this chaos allows for passions to uh, be expressed more freely. As I said, they're still very much in control of their emotions. What they call passion or chaos is, is nowhere near the real, true expression of feelings. And you can look at the story from this point of view as well. Some characters in here represent the future, and the future is a technological society. A society where, in order to be socially proficient, you need to know how to use technologies. The typewriter, the telephone, the automobile, etc and the people who represent the past. On the side of the characters representing the future, you find John, because of course he has embraced and he embraces more and more during the trip the technology of the automobile. He gets the bug. He's intoxicated with the automobile. He's in love with the automobile. He loves this technology. He is a true carnat. And Mrs. Baring, the widow, and it appears, of course, John and Peggy, used to have a relationship, now they're on their way to a divorce, and it seems like John and Mrs. Baring are developing a relationship. In fact, there is a hidden relationship which anyone can catch on by reading uh, more deeply. She, in fact, by the end of the story, will marry the artist, Douglas Warwick. Representing the past, we find the artist, Douglas Warwick, because he's a man who is not pragmatic at all. A true artist, meaning someone who goes through life absent-minded, thinking only about beauty, uh, aesthetic values, etc. So people have to go around him to get him his hat or, or to take food out of his way because he's not in the context, always absent from it and immersed in contemplation. Peggy is also part of the past because she rejects initially the technology of the automobile. She feels jealous later of the technology of the automobile. So her being left behind with the divorce is also being left behind socially. In fact, when she thinks of her life after she divorces, first she imagines that she can be a typewriter. But then it kind of turns out that she's not good at all with a typewriter, so she cannot be a secretary. Then she thinks she can be an actress, simply because she's pretending to be someone she's not, right? So the Karnats are opposed to the creative characters, those who either live immersed in an artistic world like Douglas, or those who pretend, live in a pretend world like Peggy. And then on the side of the past, there is a secondary character, who's Mrs. Gray, who's a friend of Mrs. Baring, a companion, sharing this trip together. But Mrs. Gray is like the prototype of the 19th century British woman going through Italy, looking for historical education, artistic education. She sticks by whatever she reads in the book, in the guidebook about Italy, that she carries with her. 
And the motorists all together are like a tribe. They have a tribal connection, right? This tribal connection is not rational, it's not intellectual, but it's made by, built upon their passion for the technology. And what's interesting anthropologically is cars themselves are seen as animals of different species. So that's how the interaction works, because cars gain a sentient nature from the interaction with humans. As I said before, in the interaction between humans and machines, humans become more like a machine, for example, by, not, by losing their emp empathy, by being able to ignore the suffering of dogs or other humans when they drive and they hurt someone, right? They don't feel anything. They don't feel as much emotion as, this, as if this were happening in real life. Road rage is something acknowledged from early on in this literature. And machines, through the interaction with humans, become more humanized constantly. Another way to look at the novel to match the storyline with the themes is to look at their trip once they get out of the United States. They get to, to Naples, which represents the South, and they spend time also in Capri, what you guys call Capri, but it's Capri without an accent at the end in Italian. And then they go north, to Northern Italy, and then to France. And this trip is really moving from regions that represent the past, an obsolete way of life, for example, in Capri, they're exposed to this crime, to this murder, because the person who is taking them from the port of Capri to the village of Capri, Capri has very steep climbs, the, the coachman that is helping them there is killed as the result of a simple, basic flirting with a local woman, and he is married. And because of his violation of social norms about marriages, he, a married man flirting with a woman who is not his wife, is being killed. And this is, becomes the representation of society as it was in Italy during this time. It's an exaggerated representation of a place that is anthropologically steeped, rooted in the past that lives according to Atavic rules. Atavism comes directly from the theories of Darwin. Darwin believed that the variations you see in the species can go in two different directions. One is the evolution, right? The development of new features in the species or new species altogether. But the other direction is going back to the past because even the past is still part of what we now call the genetic patrimony, the, the genetic uh, memory of, of creatures, of course, Darwin didn't know about genes. They move from this society rooted in past obsolete customs and social practices to northern Italy, which is much more industrialized. And in fact, they go to Turin, which was the heart of the automotive industry in Italy. At that time in Turin, there were dozens of companies operating just within the city of Turin. If you go to the Museo dell'Automobile in Turin, there's a beautiful room, a little larger than this classroom, with a giant picture map of Turin during that time that you can walk on with an indication of the lo location of all the automotive companies that existed at the beginning of the 20th century. And then from northern Italy, they go to France, which is supposed to be even more advanced in, uh, in the area of industrialization. So both northern Italy and France represent the future, industri industrialized future, a technological future with new tribes that are the car owners, the car mechanics, the race car drivers, etc. Okay? And think about what was going on during this period. I've mentioned Darwin already, and his idea left a strong impression on every reader 
every educated person during this time. They really believed that you could apply Darwin to society. And to them, social evolutionism in society meant if you can adapt to the new ecosystem, you survive, otherwise you're doomed socially. Meaning, if the ecosystem of tomorrow's society is heavily equipped with technologies, and you are not a human who adapts easily to using those technologies, then you are doomed socially. You are a boomer of the, the 20th century. And otherwise, you will move up in society. You are fit, you are being, if you are fit to exist and operate in this kind of society, then that fitness will be rewarded socially and economically. But as far as the representation of Italy, which plays a big part in the novel, I'll mention two examples. George Dennis was an amateur archaeologist who went to Tuscany in the 1840s. And in the introduction to his book, The Cities and Cemeteries of Etruria, which was republished several times until the, the 1870s, he tells you, he tells the reader as someone who might go to Italy, that the past is not forgotten in Italy that you go to Italy, you go to Rome, and you find that people are rough. Why? Because, of course, they're direct descendants of the warriors of the Roman Empire. So their roughness is the lingering quality their ancestors had and they still have in them. You go to Naples and you find that people are crafty, right? They'll try to con you or steal from you. Why? Because their ancestors are the Greeks, and we know how crafty those Greeks were. Just look at the Trojan horse and other similar episodes, incidents that you find in Homer's poems. And then he says, go to Tuscany and you'll find there people are much more refined. Why? Because they're direct descendants of the Etruscans who were very refined people and their elegance is testified by their monuments and everything they left. Hewlett was someone who went to Tuscany Maurice Hewlett, British writer and traveler, who came from Great Britain to travel through Tuscany in 1902, and then wrote a book in two volumes, The Road in Tuscany. And what he says is that if you go to remote valleys in Italy, especially in a place such as Tuscany, you will find that people are not changed by civilization, by industrialization. They still do the same things that their ancestors were doing. They have the same faces. For example, he goes to the mountains of Tuscany and finds shepherds who are singing songs. And he says, look, this shows evidence of the great poetry of the past. Tuscany had Dante, had Petrarch, had the great poets of the early modern era. And in fact, even the people of today still have those skills they inherited from their ancestors. And even a simple shepherd with no education can improvise a beautiful song. Of course, it's all a construction, right? He ignored that there was an oral tradition of singing among, among those shepherds, and that some of those shepherds were able to read read literature, at least popular literature, okay? In fact, during the same time and well into the 1950s in Tuscany, you would have found that the names of farmers often were the same names of old characters in traditional Italian literature or even classical literature. Because they did have, they did not have a formal education, but they had some education. Okay, so. I have a few passages here. I'll just read together with you the first one while the attendance is being signed and circulated. But you find confirmation of what I was saying before from the very first line of the novel. John and I are going to get a divorce and an automobile. And notice the use of the verb get as if both the automobile and the divorce were products that you avail yourself of using your mind. Then she adds, perhaps I should say an automobile and then a divorce. And from this you get the storyline, their trip with an auto in Europe 
to be followed by a divorce that will never come. And you also get that the automobile will somehow get in the way and prevent the divorce from happening. For the author is to come first, but on the other hand, we would not get the machine did we not intend to get a divorce too. But keep in mind how the divorce, the desire for the divorce is born. It's born out of the desire to be fashionable, right? And to be seen as independent and powerful in society. And then you have to match this theme with the automobile and see how these two things are intertwined and developed together. And she said, naturally, I'm a little excited over these purchases. And she calls the divorce a purchase. Never having an auto before, it's important to notice that it's their first experience, nor a divorce either for that matter. But I wish to make myself quite clear that injustice may not be done me by those who have little understanding of the new thought, Ditto Woman, where you have to put together new and woman to understand this passage. As, as I've said before, the new woman movement was the first label assigned in the media, in the press, in books, to the feminist movement in the US at the end of the 19th century. Meaning, you can say whatever you want, but I'm a new woman, I'm an independent woman, and so I will not change my mind because you think that I shouldn't be doing this thing, I shouldn't be getting a divorce. And in fact, getting a divorce makes me a new independent woman. Okay, so, uh, yes. Those sorts of sentences very common in Edwardian literature because I read a turn of the screw the other day and it was it, it had it made me put me out of the story a bit just because I needed to like sort of read aloud just to piece together like <laughs> what was being said. Oh, you mean the complexity of the syntax? Yes. That's so typical, common. of course. But keep in mind that the average reader from that period was someone who would have read hundreds of books in their lives. And therefore, not only did they have some education, at least at the level of the first years of high school, but also quite an experience in reading novels with complex syntax. Okay. Yes, it is true that there are some passages that are syntactically involved, so to speak, and need careful uh, reading or, or a second reading. It does change once they embark in their trip and you get the chronicle of their trip to Italy. There usually the syntax is sim more, more simplified and the only difficulty would be to really imagine the place because there are long descriptions of the places they go through uh, and if you have never seen, let's say, I'm not talking about Florence, but let's say San Marino and the Republic of San Marino, then the description uh, might sound a bit obscure or, or read too much like a fairy tale, right? But uh, yeah, there are a few passages where you find syntax that is typical of literature from that period. So it's a, yes, it's a romantic, comedy of sorts in form of a novel, but the style is somewhat elevated. Yeah, I was just wondering because... Certainly I, more than the lightning conductor. I've read a lot of books in the past, mainly like the classics and modern, so I've never really tapped into the Mordian literature, and it's so interesting because in modern day, I've heard from all my literature and um, writing classes to just avoid those long sentences at all costs. It's right. so interesting, there was such a common people within Edward and Victor in the past. And, and what adds another layer of complexity is the constant deployment of irony. Because, so they are constantly saying something and suggesting something else. So keep that in mind as well. Okay? So make sure you all sign the attendance. And uh, I'll see you on Thursday.